good to be with you all this morning one more time. If uh, you haven't been here or don't remember, I've been, uh, whenever I've been speaking, going through a series in Colossians. I think this is maybe the third, fourth message, can't remember exactly how many, uh, that I've been in there. Um, and today we uh, are going to be in Colossians chapter 1 still, verses 15 through 23. And as you know, this has been culminating, right? There's been a culmination of knowledge and information that's all built upon this letter. That's you know how letters are written. If you've ever written a letter, I don't know if we do it anymore, or an email, you don't just write sporadic thoughts, you know, here in the next paragraph, a totally different topic. It's all built upon a singular theme, right? While you're writing this letter to somebody, especially back then with all the effort and cost to write such a letter. So it all matters. What was said before matters what's being said now. And so um, just a brief little review of some of those things. We don't have time to go into all of it again, of course, those are separate messages, but recapping our memory a little bit. Up to this point, uh, in all the introduction, Paul, the writer of Colossians, to the uh, church at uh, Colossae, uh, has been making clear uh, a lot of uh, points about like what is true faith, what does faith look like, and what are the marks, the fruit of true faith in our lives, of true believers. And there's been several points. I just want to summarize some of those for you from mainly last week, if you remember. Um, in verse 9, it talked about how a, a, a mark, a fruit of true faith is a love and a concern for other believers, right? The second one would be a, a knowledge of God's will, spiritual wisdom and understanding. That's the second fruit, that we understand God's will for our lives and what he would have us to do, which principally is found from his word, right? Remember, we've seen that. If we're not in God's word, we can't anticipate that we would hear from him because that's how he's spoken to us. Number three is there would be fruit of an honor and love for Christ, of becoming like him. We have a desire and drive to put off sin and become more like him. Number four is we will bear fruit in the spirit. That is, we will begin to look like Christ. The old flesh will begin to die off as we mortify those things and we'll be putting on attributes of Christ. Instead of being angry and you know, impetuous, we'll, we'll be patient and kind, right, and gentle. Instead of being, you know, uh, fearful, we will have the peace of Christ in our lives. Number five is we would have the fruit of endurance. That was, we will endure trials. There's going to be trials in life. As we know, the Christian life is not ever meant to be easy in a cakewalk. We are going through the fire, as it will, as a word of being reformed. And it's going to be difficult. So we must have endurance. It produces endurance in our life, and that is also going to produce patience and joy as you see that God is faithful in the midst of our trials. And lastly, it's going to produce thankfulness. And this is all culminating for a purpose here. So Paul ended this previous section with saying that Colossian church, we should be thankful. And why are we able to be thankful? I just want to read the last few verses Again, 12 through 14 of last message. Paul says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you, that is, believers at Colossae and us as well, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So it's building into this idea that all this fruit, this ability to look different, to be different, to put on a new a new personhood, a new character traits of, of Christ, to be Christ-like, uh, is all based upon the work of Christ in our lives. We can't manufacture, manufacture this on our own. We can't change ourselves. We can't be better. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. There's nothing we can do to manufacture this. It's through Christ's works in our life, right? It's all been building towards this. It's because we have been de delivered from the domain of darkness. We haven't ran away from it. We haven't escaped. We haven't broken out of prison. We've been delivered, right? And we've been transferred to God's kingdom. We've been redeemed, forgiven. All these words talk about nothing you and I have done. God, Christ has done this for us, right? They have been given an inheritance. They didn't like earn this. No inheritance is earned, right? We we're just born in this family. We've been made into the family of God. We have been given inheritance. It was pre previously reserved for who? God himself. Like an incredible inheritance. There is no greater inheritance. But we've been grafted in. So this, all this, understanding all this, they have no recourse but to what? Be thankful. Because wow, that is, an, that is beyond our understanding. It produces this thankfulness in us, right? 
So it should be the same for you and I. We should be, when we understand this, like if you're a believer, we should be overwhelmingly thankful. And that's where we ended last week. So today's section addresses who Christ is to accomplish this. Because again, going back briefly, I don't want, I can't go into this in depth too much, but the heresies that they were struggling with here, the wrong thinking that the Colossian church was struggling with, were all centered upon who Christ was and what he could do for them, right? Well, like, not, it's the wrong way of saying that. Who he was and what he accomplished for them, right? So today's section of scripture is talking about uh, who Christ is, who our Redeemer is, and who he must be to accomplish what he has done. Because they believed it, they had wrong thinkings about it. And it was creating all kinds of problems in their church. And this is primarily one of the biggest reasons Paul is writing them in the first place, to combat this and to correct this thinking. So they lost Christ's identity, who he was, and all the hope and the fruit that Christ has secured for us is risk at risk of being lost if we lose who he is. Who he is and what he accomplished is everything to our faith. It's not a small aspect. It's not just one piece of the pie. It's everything. Without Christ, none of that is possible. Nothing we just read about. None of that fruit. None of that love, concern for other believers, none of that knowledge of his will, understanding him, none of that you know, honor for him, becoming like him, bearing fruit in the spirit, enduring trials and the difficulties of life with hope and peace, none of that thankfulness, none of that is possible if we haven't met Christ for who he is, right? So just summarizing some of those wrong beliefs really quick, what they were believing that was wrong. If you really want to hear them, you can go back last time I spoke, and I went into those in detail, but Again, we don't have as much time this morning to go into all that detail. But let me just summarize who, what they did with Christ, right? So in a just, they really took Christ and they demoted him as their mediator in the, the you know, remedy for our sin. A mediator is someone who stands between, right? Someone who stands in our behalf. Instead, they were actually worshiping angels in their place. And this all birthed out of this idea, this wrong view of nature, of like matter. They believed that everything that was of the natural world was sinful and inherently evil. Right? Therefore, Christ, who was claiming to be God, could not have created and himself been of, made of physical matter when he came and was you know, born of a virgin and, and lived a life. He couldn't be both God, perfect God, holy and righteous and good, and then made of imperfect, broken, sinful matter. Right? He couldn't be both these things. So there's lots of ways they could, like, you know, have wrong thinkers on this, but basically he was either created and not really God and himself sinful, or he didn't really create it, or you know, some variation of those things, right? They, they, they took him out of what he really was, and Paul's going to combat this. He no longer could be a good enough mediator between God and man. He was marred by sin, right? So what what they do? They found other mediators. They went into worshiping angels and other angelic beings, in the place. They were the mediators. They would pray to them. And there's, this is not, this is, I mean, I don't know a lot of people who worship angels anymore, but there's other flavors of this today. We worship other people in the place. Maybe Mary, right? I can't go directly to God. I go through a mediator who himself is imperfect because I've taken Christ out of the equation. It's one of the devil's oldest you know, tricks in the book is take Christ out, disqualify him in our minds, and we'll go to something else that we think is a better option, but really it makes no sense when we use our own logic. Why would we go to something less when I have something already greater? And Paul's going to correct that in their minds. So in their stead, they worship angels as mediators, and they fail to trust that Christ is sufficient as our mediator and our God. That the word of God is sufficient for everything pertaining to life and godliness. All we need to know about God is re revealed in person of Christ and in his word that is itself just revealing Christ, right? Everything we need about life and godliness is revealed in those two sources. So what the Colossian church was at the heart missing, maybe some of us in our own churches, well, I mean our church perhaps, or our own homes, is that we also may be missing and faltering on and understanding and clinging to the glory, the power, and the all-sufficiency of the person of Christ, that he is all we need for life and godliness. Every aspect of our life, everything we need, is comes from an understanding and a reliance upon Christ and what he did for us. That's what Paul's going to argue and what I'm going to argue. So, Paul's writing today's passage to instill this understanding of that God is supreme. He is all-powerful and he is all-sufficient, right? He's everything you need. 
And so in response, believers back then and believers today, you and I, if you're believing, is to in, be encouraged to worship Christ in all his beauty and his majesty and his sufficiency. You don't need anything else, right? So, I don't have a great title, but I just have a question. This is the big idea. This is, if you get nothing else out of today, like, think on this idea. Who do you know Jesus Christ to be? Who do you understand him to be? Because we all have conceptions. We all have understandings. Things maybe we grew up in church or otherwise. We all understand something about who he is. At least we think we know who he is. But perhaps that is marred by some, you know, c- cultural influence or some, you know, a biblical understanding. And let's go to what the Bible has to say about who he is. And then there we find life and meaning and purpose and everything we need. Right? So, starting in verse 15. Let me just read it all really quick. Just to get a good little context. Just, just try to wrap your head around it and listen and hear what Paul's saying here. Okay? We're going to unpack it. Verse 15 of chapter 1. It says, He, that is Christ, right? He's talking about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things held together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly, established and steadfast, not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So I have five main points about who Christ is, who he's revealed to be in scripture. I'll give them to you at the beginning and then we'll unpack them, okay? The first one is, Christ is Lord of all things. The second one, Christ is the creator of all things. Third, Christ is the sustainer of all things. Fourth, Christ is the meaning of all things. And five, Christ is the redeemer of all things. So back to the first one, Christ is Lord of all things. That's verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. So I just want to say Christ is everything that God wants us to know about himself. We don't need to look for God anywhere else. Everything we need to know about who God is, is in Christ. We may not see it all, we may not understand it all in our finite minds, but everything he wants us to know about himself and is revealed about himself, we can see in Christ. He's sufficient. So I'm going to use use the word image here. Paul is describing Christ as making clear what was previously hidden. When we couldn't see who God was, we now can see clearly who God is in Christ. It's being made clear being made, the image is being made like manifest. We can see it, but we could previously not see. What they were waiting for, the Jews were waiting and hoping for, is now made visible and clear in Christ. The word in Greek is icon. That is something like, it's like a statue or a profile, something that's the resemblance of the thing it's representing, right? A clear image, a representation. A representation of what? Of the invisible God. That is, again, He's God's revelation to us of the unseen Father. We can see in the Godhead what he wants us to see in Christ. Right? I love this quote by John Calvin. He says, We must be careful not to look for him, that is God. We must be careful not to look for him anywhere else. For apart from Christ, whatever offers itself to us in the name of God will turn out to be an idol. Summarizing that, we should not look for God anywhere else but in Christ. Because anything else we might find of him, that we think is God, will just be idolatry and heresy. It's not who he's revealed himself to be. And we try that all the time in culture, right? All kinds of different beliefs that are building upon what God, who he is, but we're really just, we're just interpreting him according to our own minds, right? Not what, who Christ is. So that is just fix our eyes on him, on Christ, what the word says about him, who he is, who he says himself to be. 
And it says he's the firstborn of all creation. And this is, again, combating this, this thought that he must be like a created being himself or that he must be lower than God himself. He's not really God. You know, if he's really creating in, in part of his matter, you know, he, he's, he's made of flesh, like he can't really be God. They're trying to devote him. And Paul's saying really here that he's the firstborn, not meaning like he was like the first creation. What he's saying is in that culture, the firstborn was of the most importance above all else, right? He's the principal heir, the main heir of the father's kingdom in all of his riches. And we are adopted in. He's the firstborn. And through him in his birth and his death, we can become born of that family as well. He is above all else. No one above him, including the angels, right? So he is Lord of all things. There's no one above him because he, he is God himself. He's not a lesser God. He is God, right? That's what Paul's saying. It's verse 15. Verse 16, we see the second point. Let's read it. For by him, Christ, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, with the thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So the second thing we see about who Christ is, is Christ is the creator of all things, right? He created everything. Through him, God the Father brought all things to be. He's not himself a creation. He is the creator, right? This reiterates Paul's point that Christ is the prime mover. He's the one who did all this. All this is here because Christ, at the beginning, created all things. He's the author of creation. He's not a product of it. You can't create yourself, right? Everything you create is lesser than you. We try to create computers that are as smart as people, right? All these AI, all these new programs, they're never quite, they're never quite the same. They're never going to reach that because it can never surpass the creator. The creation can never surpass the creator, right? God himself is the creator. Christ is the creator. Not only is Christ the prime mover, the creator, but all creation was created because of him, for him, right? Read the end of that verse. All things were created through him and for him. That is for his sake. God the Father allowed Christ the Son to create all this for his glory, that he might be honored above all else. And here the Colossian church is demoting him, stealing from that honor. Maybe we do the same. Christ is Lord over all that is because, why? He's God. It's simple, right? It gets complicated and we try to, we try to change that fact. Therefore, all that was, all that is, and all that ever will be is subject to him, including us, including the angels. And this is what's ironic, is that they would remove Christ. They thought he wasn't sufficient. He's not enough. He's not a good enough mediator between God and me, a sinner. So they remove him, and they go for angels. But, I mean, he's over the angels. He's better than them. He, he created them, right? So they remove the creator to bring in a, created, a creation to represent them. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. He's all we need. He's our Lord. He's our creator. Yes? Verse 17, the third thing we see about who Christ is. Let's read it. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. I love this. Christ is, number three, the sustainer of all things. He holds all things together continue and work as they're properly designed to function. Paul drives home this point that we saw in verse 16 earlier, actually. He was before all creation. Not like some of the creation. He was before all creation because he's God. Only thing that could pre-exist, the creation, is the one who created it. God himself, right? Hebrews 1, 2-3 talks about the same thing. I love it. Hebrews 1, 2-3 says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through him, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature. Exact imprint. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Upholds us. He sustains the universe. Every part of it is working because of him. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. I mean, it's like he's writing to the same group, right? Like, you have no, no other need, not even from angels. Nothing else you need is, Christ is enough. I love that. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. And I love this quote. I think it was from R.C. Sproul used to say, but there's not a single rogue atom in the whole world. 
mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in the world that's happening just by circumstance, by, by happenstance, by luck, by coincidence. God is in holding all these things and coordinating it for his glory and for his purpose. And that's Christ who's doing that. So he's the sustainer of all things, including your life and my life, including the good things and the, the hard things. He's the sustainer. He's the provider, right? Verse 18, that's number four. Sorry, four. Verse 14 says, He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in everything, sorry, that in everything he might be preeminent. So number four is Christ is the meaning of all things. And go back to verse 16 again. It says, for him. This, all, everything, you and I and the seats you're sitting in, all this was created for God's glory and specifically for the glory of Christ, that he may be honored as our creator and our sustainer. He's the meaning. The meaning of us is his glory. And I go to this like every message. I just can't, I can't stick away from it. But the first question of an answer of the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? And I love it. It's so simple. To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. That's our meaning. That's why we're here. And, I, and John Piper summarized that another way. And I really like his summar, summarization. He says, and God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. You know, our chief end is to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. And he is most glorified in us when we are just, just simply satisfied in him. Christ is all we need. It's also in him we find meaning to everything, every purpose of our lives, especially as Christians. We can understand that, I think, better than anyone else. There's nothing in your life that has any meaning. Where it's meaningless apart from Christ and his work in our lives and what he his purpose for us. And no reason, no, no wonder in our culture when we remove Christ and the meaning and God and everything, it's like it's meaningless. There's no hope. And people are 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 without hope and they're they're miserable and they take their lives. No thought of it. Why not? I mean, there's no other meaning. As soon as I lose any temporal enjoyment and the things I'm doing, like there's no purpose to be here anymore. I'm in despair. Because we've removed our purpose, and that is Christ. In the body, the head gives the body its meaning and its control. I mean, I'm in healthcare, so I can't help but think like this. Like the body, the brain does, controls everything. Nothing happens in your body unless the brain tells it to. Sometimes there's a disconnect, right? There's a nerve that gets cut. Is, are those muscles diseased and broken? No, they're still there. They're just not being told what to do. So they're just sitting there and you're paralyzed. The brain controls everything. So in the same way, Christ controls like all the purpose and the hope and the meaning. Everything in our lives is, is only has meaning because of Christ. He is the meaning of us, why we're here. Why you do what you do, why you go to work, why you go to school, why you continue on when things are hard and when things are good. Why you have joy when things are good because of Christ, because he gives meaning to all things. So from Christ, we derive all of our purpose, our meaning in our lives. Through him, we see things clearly that were before imperceivable in our darkened minds, right? We couldn't see. We couldn't understand. But he made us alive and gave us eyes that could see. Through his quickening of our hearts, we can now hear the word of the Lord and believe. Before, we would hear the word and our hearts would be hardened. But now he softened our hearts. Through him, we were regenerated and could taste the goodness of God. Before, when we heard things of God, it was utter foolishness. But now, it's things that give us life and hope. If you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you're probably a Christian. You have not, not, not yet tasted because you have not been regenerated. Through him, we can feel as our heart of stone is removed and he gives us a heart of flesh. In him, he generates all the meaning in our lives. And this is all starting in the, from Christ's resurrection. His resurrection marks the beginning of a new creation, right? So it says here, he is the beginning of firstborn from the dead that everything might be preeminent. Christ's resurrection marks the beginning of a new creation, one that is no longer dead in its sin, but we are now alive to God, right? He's the new Adam who accomplished what the old Adam could not. He failed. In him, we were sin sinners. Even if before you committed your first sin, you were a sinner because you're, the person who represented you, Adam, failed. We we're already sinners before we were even born. But in Christ, in the, re the new Adam, his resurrection, he rose from the dead, guaranteed us a hope because he rose, we too will rise. Right? There's a hope secured in him, our meaning. I love this word preeminent, that he might be preeminent. Christ has always been God, eternal, powerful. 
That's never been different. But I love what he's saying here is that because of his resurrection, because he rose, he now has a new accolade. A new, makes him even higher in honor, worthy of honor. Standing above any other. Not only is he the Lord of the universe, as we saw, right? Not only is he the creator. Not only does he sustain the world. That's enough. No one's like him. But now he came, put on flesh, and lived and died so that he may redeem it. Nobody else could have done that. Nobody else did do that. The world has all kinds of saviors all around you. People who save you from this, who who intervene and help you with this. All kinds of saviors. People who want to be a savior. But there is no savior like Christ. No one could do what he did. Not even close. For in him all the fullness of God, verse 19, was pleased to dwell. Again, he's driving home the point that Christ is fully God and fully man. They would want to say, he can't be both. He can't be both. He can't be God and sinful flesh. Paul's saying he is 100% God and 100% man. That's some crazy math there. You can't be, nothing doesn't work like that in our world. But in Christ, in God, it can happen. Ask James about that later. He could talk to you about two, one hundred percent. But he's not a created being endured with, endued with some of God's characteristics. He's fully God, all of his characteristics. Who he is, he is God. But he's also man. He can represent us. Number five. Let's keep doing that. Number five. Who Christ is. Verse 20. It says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So number five. Christ is the redeemer of all things. I've touched on this briefly already. But this is, the, as we can call it, the magnum opus, the greatest work, what Christ did. He created everything. He's the Lord of everything. He sustains it. He holds it. There's no rogue atoms floating around out there doing their own thing. Like, he's coordinating everything. You ever seen those things where people put, like, a bunch of balls, like, drop balls on, on a table? And they're trying to keep them from falling off the table? Or just you can imagine what that would look like, right? At first, like, they're just starting to go, and you're, just, you're catching some, and then you try to go catch the other ones, and, what, and before long, they're just everywhere because you can't keep up. That's just a few balls on a table. But God is, Christ is upholding all these things all at once. Not a single molecule is rogue. And in him, we can put our trust because he is good and he is in control. But this, that's, not, that's not even his greatest work. His greatest work, his magnum opus, is that he came and he redeemed his own creation by his own blood. It's through his redemption, the restoration of peace between God and man, that we were alienated in our sin, that he made us united again. And our future glorification, that we will go and become glorified. We will go to heaven and we will be made perfect. These are big words, right? (laughs) But that we not only are going to be like our sins washed away here, we're not only forgiven, but we'll be made perfect again. And it's secured. You ever think sometimes like, what if he just, fails to come back. I mean, he said he made all these promises, but if he fails to come back, well, he's never failed his promises. And all this is secured in Christ because he rose, we will rise. All this hope is secured. Just, you know, the, the book, end of the book is written and you can guarantee it's not going to change because what Christ did. Our future glorification is secured and evil is restrained. Uh, beautiful what Christ did, right? All this, that's his greatest work. He is our redeemer. So again, he's Lord, creator, sustainer, a meaning of our lives and our redeemer. That's who Christ is. So verses 21 to 23, and then I'm going to wrap it up. What does this mean for us? This is a short part, I promise. Verse 21, and you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, you and me, our minds are as guilty of sin as the rest of us. Sometimes we kind of let's say like, oh, well, you know, like, I want to do the right thing, but I got caught up. Or these, this happened, you know. It's, it's all starts here. Our minds are unregenerate, and especially in our, in our sin and our flesh. And it, it, that's what causes us to do these evil things. It's not just our broken flesh. It's right here, right? We're alienated and hostile in mind. And this is not just, he didn't just throw us out there for nothing. In this Gnostic, Judaic Gnostic belief, if you don't remember going back to the heresies, the Gnostic belief was that, the mind was separate from the sinful body, right? So either they thought that I have to be rigidly like legalist and not do anything wrong. Like I can't, I can't even enjoy good food, like nothing, like nothing good of the flesh of the world. My body is, is okay. It's acceptable. 
they have to be really legalistic. Oh, the other side, they would say, because my mind and my spirituality is separate from my body, my mind is good and my, my body's bad, I can do whatever I want in my body. I can live it up. It doesn't affect my spiritual life. Both are opposite of the spectrum, but they're both heresies and wrong. It's not what Christ says, right? It's not what the Bible says. So Paul's saying here that like your minds are as wicked as your body. Because they, they were the particular one that thought, my mind's okay. It's my body that's wrong. And I'm just going to like not do these bad things and I'm okay. Paul objects to that thought. We aren't good people stuck in a sinful body, right? You hear that all the time in culture still. Oh, we're good people. But it's our circumstances that become a problem. Or it's my upbringing. Or I, I had, you know, I didn't have as many opportunities as a child. To, you know, I grew up in the ghetto. That's why I shot people. Like, no, we're wicked. It's in our hearts. We're all like that. We can kill people with our words or, you know, with weapons. doesn't matter. We're all sinful. It's inside of us. That's who we are. We're not good people stuck in sinful bodies. We're, we're the flesh. You know, we're all sinful. And this is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a second to like, what is the difference here between the, her, the heresies and the truth? The heresy says like, matter is just inherently sinful. The truth is we were created good. All things are created good. It's sin tainted the world. That we have been come utterly, that is every aspect of our, of our humanity has become tainted by sin. Not that we're as wicked as we can be. We're not, you know, Hitler or anything, right? But every part of us has become tainted with sin. And therefore, we are lost in our sin. It's only through Christ redeeming us through his blood, his perfect life, and his redemption that we can be saved. So we are, our minds and our bodies are, we're, we're wicked. We're just, we're evil. We're sinful, we should say, right? We're tainted by sin. Verse 22 says, but he has now reconciled in his body a flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. And this is like the biggest like slap against the heresy here. Through paradox, you know what paradox is? is like you expect one thing, but you get another thing. They're in contrast to each other. Contrasting this, Paul refutes the whole heresy, the Judaic Gnostic heresy of this church that all things of the body were inherently evil. When he shows them that, you know, their belief, Christ cannot be good and a good creator, and God, and also made of sinful flesh, right? He's saying God became flesh and lived a perfect life. And through that life, he became our mediator and our redeemer. Through the very thing you thought that was this flaw, he redeemed you. Just complete paradox. And just, that, like, your you're thinking is wrong, and you've rejected him for the very thing you need from him, ironically. Right? Because he is God and man, He's an acceptable mediator on our behalf. The angels are neither God nor man. They can't represent you or me. Nobody else can represent you. But Christ is the perfect representative for you and for me. He is fully God. He can stand before him righteous. He is fully man. He went through everything we've been through. And he can stand on our behalf, the perfect mediator. It was through Christ's perfect life, bodily death, and literal resurrection that he not only proved that he is God, he conquered over death, but he also reconciled us from all of sinful flesh and, and who we are at the core. And verse 23, if indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in the all creation under heaven, in which I, Paul, became a minister. It is faith and hope that we are guaranteed through the work of Christ. We have faith because of his regeneration in our, in our lives. We have hope that the story is written. And nothing can change that, right? It is in Christ and in Christ alone that we obtain faith and hope, not through the help of angels or any other being. Christ is enough. So let me just wrap it up with a little summary. Who is Christ to you? That's really the question. Who do you understand him to be? And who is your relationship to you? Sometimes we come over familiar, right? We kind of get used to the whole idea of Christ. It just becomes kind of a byword, right? It's a curse word, quite frankly. Reduce Christ to be a passive, kind of impersonal force in our lives that we can tap into when we need him. And I'm really struggling. I can pray and Christ will show up like a guardian angel, right? Kind of this positive energy that we can tap into whenever we need him, right? Maybe you've kind of felt that kind of relationship about Christ in the world, and at least American Christianity. He's just kind of like Christ. He's like, he's your best friend. He's a buddy. You know, he's a good luck charm. He's our cosmic butler. I can just call him whenever I need something. Need that new red bicycle, you know? That's, that's really, that, that's from like 
Shane, I don't know here. He was our, um, what do you call it, uh, Sunday school way back in the day. He used to talk about that. You just pray to God when you want a red shiny bicycle, a new bicycle. And I remember that since I was, like, as a kid. Like, I was just praying to God because I want something, right? We do that. We treat him like he's a cosmic butler, right? He's just going to show up and give me what I want. He's not just our Savior. As amazing as that is, he's also our Lord. Scripture shows us that Christ is so much more than what the world tries to sell us. He is Lord, creator, sustainer, meaning of our lives, and redeemer. He came and took on a permanent, permanent human form. This is the most beautiful thing, I think. That he took on a, he, he was, he's God. He took on a body with scars and all of its ailments for all eternity. It's not gone. It's permanent. And he's still up there right now with the human body for you and for me. A broken world can only be reconciled to a perfect God through a mediator who is both God and man. Angels and other mediators are neither of those. Christ is enough. So I would just say, place your faith in Christ. And a beautiful way to see this is verse 21 to 23. Just put your name in. Anytime it says you, let's just do that together. You put your own name, okay? Verse 21, and you, put your name. I'll say Ethan. And Ethan, who was once alienated and hostile in mind doing evil deeds, he, Christ, has now reconciled his, that is Ethan's body, Sorry, sorry, I got this wrong. Reconciled in his, Christ's body of flesh, by his death, in order to present Ethan holy and blameless and above reproach before him. All this so that I may be holy, set apart. We sing that song, holy, holy, holy. So we may be like that. If indeed Ethan continues in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that he, Ethan, has heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Simply put, believe it. Believe who Christ is and live in light of it. Place your faith in him. Throw off all these other sinful notions about other things you rely on. Christ is enough. That's what Paul's saying to them. That's what Paul's saying to us today. Christ is enough for everything pertaining to life and godliness. And where do we see Christ? Through his word. He's a revelation of his word and the word is a revelation of Christ. They are the same. Well, sorry. Let me pray. And then, I'm not sure what's next, but maybe a song. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for just the truth of it. Thank you primarily, Father, that we can pray to you just like right now. Through the fact that we have a mediator, someone who stands between us, who has not only redeemed us and sustained the world and created it and is Lord over it, Father, but he has an intimate relationship with us that we can have an intimate relationship with you, the Father. And he has left in us the spirit that we may walk like him and learn to become more like him. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us and continue to do for us. And may those who do not know you today feel the pull on the tug on their heart to know you and to place their faith in you because there's no other hope outside of Christ for us. We pray all this in Christ's name.